Hi, welcome to the noise path. In this episode, we're going to take a look at something a viewer sent in. These are a whole bunch of Anritsu K250 BiSDs. These are rated from 100 MHz to 40 GHz. They have a K connector, of course, and they're rated about half an amp, and they have an insertion loss of about 1.2 dB. So they're pretty good BiSDs. Anritsu does make very good BiSDs. This is, I would say, a maybe a mid-range model. So they all have the same issue. All of them have no DC connection. There's no DC path anymore. And the role of a bias D, as you know, is that you can apply a DC voltage and it combines that with the AC signal on one port, but it blocks it on the other one. So it allows you to apply a DC voltage to one side of the circuit, but not on the other. And then they're also decoupled capacitively from each other. Now these are rated to 500 milliamps. And if you put more than that through them, you can that destroy them, you will damage them. These most likely have died either because somebody accidentally shorted the output RF when they were using it or that they were connected to a circuit that uses a lot more current than half an, an amp and that essentially damaged them and destroyed them. I think this came from a group that works on power amplifiers so it's not surprising that this would happen. So this become kind of consumable. I also have one over here which is one of the ones I've had for a long time. This is an SHF123B. These are fantastic biases, some of the best in the industry and they're also extremely expensive. And you can see that this one is rated to 65 gigahertz. It has a V connector on both sides, but it also goes down to 50 kilohertz, which is a huge advantage when you want to use them for broadband applications. You don't have this uh, kind of low frequency cutoff, this high pass response from them. And you can see how much larger it is because of how it needs to be built. So why would these things die in the first place? What is the deal with the current limit? And you can see this one is only 0.4 amp current limit on them. Even though the circuit diagram here is just an inductor and a capacitor, this is the lumped model. This is just conceptual. It is far more complicated than that inside. Because this inductor cannot be a very large high value inductor. Because if you do that, its self-resonance frequency will not be anywhere close to 65 gigahertz which means that this thing will set, resonate out and you will get a horrible response through it. Which means that these components are made out of a series of combined elements together, slowly making the inductor larger and larger and larger until it gets to the point so that you can have an overall cutoff response that is written over here. The last inductor, the one that connects to the RF path, has to have an extraordinarily small parasitic footprint. Because if you hang a tiny capacitor over here, you're going to destroy the response of this. Its loss will be horrible and its impedance will be horrible at 65 gigahertz. So the last wire, the last connection to this line has to be very, very thin. It has to be a tiny inductor uh, in terms of its dimensions so that it reduces parasitic capacitances and that's where the current limitation comes in. That li line is so thin that if you put more than 0.4 amp through it, you just simply vaporize it. Now, I don't know if this, is the same, uh, this has the same problem or not, but I suspect that's what's going on with these ones. So I thought we'd take them apart and take a look inside of them. Probably not repairable, but it's still educational. Well, let's see how do we open this. So these connectors are not going to come off so easily, which we don't want to move them anyway because the, two, the capacitor is sitting in the middle of it. This will come off and we'll have a wire going in. I think there's going to be an access point. I can kind of see it underneath these stickers. So first thing, to take off the stickers. Well, these biases are certainly designed not to be really repairable because the screw over here, which allows you to access the RF port on this side, on this side, is essentially uh, soldered in place. So they put it in, assemble it, and then they solder it. They do it to you know, maintain its characteristics so that it doesn't change and so that no one can open it and mess with it. Uh, but I, I managed to take it apart and I understand exactly how this put together now. So I want to show you under the microscope where we can examine every part very closely. So let's go ahead and take a close look at this here. So here's the first access hole. You can see it is totally welded shut. We can't reach anything. And here's the one on the back. And these are in line with the RF path here on both sides. And that's how you would make the final connection. So there's no access at all. And here's the bias line going in. So I've already unscrewed it. We can try to pull it out and see what comes out. There we go. Let me unscrew it a little bit more. There we go. I feel some resistance. There it is. Let's pull it out. Ah, and there's our damage right there. There you go. You can see the coil is being burnt up. And it's totally discolored. And this is a destructive removal because you can see uh, this end of it was connected to the RF line. Now it's no longer connected. But that's okay, we'll examine that in a second. Let's unwind this. There's some core inside. Must be some special material to increase the inductance of this line. Because this is a single inductor, tapered. That's probably why the low pass cutoff frequency is only 100 megahertz, not lower. It's really made of only one component. We can unwind it. And there's the core, material is burnt up. There you go, it's kind of satisfying. 
There it is. It's wrapped around this custom machined part, some high permeability material perhaps, that they're using. Could be iron powder mixed in with it. We can pull this out. There you go. That's what they have made custom for this. Very interesting. There's a little piece of plastic maybe for some strain relief and further isolation. Now, this is interesting too. There's a capacitor embedded in this connector. Here's our ground. There's a capacitor. So we have a, a C connection across the bias input. Helps filter things and isolate things further. Here's the connection and the input. Nothing unusual there. So we can follow this back a little bit more. Where's the other end of it now? We lost the other end. It's very long now. There it is. So at the very end, we have again nothing special. We can unwind it further. And that's it. So the end of this is supposed to make direct contact with our RF line. Let's see if we can find it. There it is. That's on the inside. There you go. Look at that. Very interesting. And then there is something on this side that makes contact. I've already unscrewed this partially. So you can see when I screw this, if I were to screw this front connector, it will basically go further in, and at the, at the input there, it will make some contact. So let's go ahead and completely uh, remove it. If I can, there you, go, you can see it will basically come out from here. And there must be something that in there that makes a good contact. There you go. Look at that. <laughs> That's the end of it. That's kind of funny looking. It must be very springy. Let's try it out. You see, it's hard to reach it. There you go. Look at that. It's springy indeed. I should be able to pull this out, and the pin of the K connector should come out with it. There it is. There's a pin of the K connector. This is now empty, of course. There you go. Looks looks nice. So this is a custom thing that they have added at the end. This soldered in, as you can see. This basically allows you to screw this in and then make a nice pressed contact, RF contact, to the other side. So we still haven't seen the capacitor. Hmm. We have to find the capacitor. Ah, there is the capacitor. Right there, sitting on top of the other pin. Look how tiny it is. There it is. That's it. That little plate is our capacitor. So if I remove the other connector, we should be able to examine this and maybe even measure what its capacitance is. It can't be very large. Of course, it doesn't need to be. Very cool. Look at that. So on the other side is our connector. So they're using one end of this connector to press against the other one in order to achieve this connection. So there it is. So the end of that presses on top of this capacitor, making the connection to the other side. And that's how you get your AC coupled line. And the DC coupled line is the end of this inductor that I showed you comes in somewhere in there and makes contact to that line somewhere down in there. And that, that can only be assembled, that last step can only be assembled if you have access to this screw and to this screw, which is exactly what we don't have. But even if you did have access to it, I mean, this coil is not going to be so easy to replace. This is really, really small and obviously custom made and so on. And you need this piece and that material is not burnt away at this interface. That kind of ruins it. So I think they all have this problem, which means it's basically not really repairable, but it's still very cool to take it apart. I'm going to try and remove this connector too, see if we can take a look at the capacitor a little bit better. All right, I've managed to take this out, and there's the capacitor. Again, this is very, very small. I'm not so sure if it's very easy to measure it, but I think it might be worthwhile trying anyway. All right, I managed to cut it out and make it into a tiny little piece here. So we're going to put it into this LCR fixture and hopefully be able to make some measurements. Just drop it in here, and there it is. Hopefully, this is making good contact. Let's try it out. All right, here we go. So the LCR meter is set up. Right now, I've kept the connection open. We're going to close it. And look at that, one nanofarad, spot on. That's a reasonable amount that makes sense for this kind of application to use a one nanofarad capacitor, and that also explains part of the low cutoff frequency operation as well. So it looks good. I think we've done a good reverse engineering of exactly how it was built. Let's take a moment and compare this to the far more sophisticated and high performance SHF bias T. So here's the BNC connection where the DC is applied. First it goes through this inductor. You can see it has an RC filter in parallel to it and a resistor at the bottom. Then another inductor which is slightly smaller in dimension and therefore smaller in inductance. Then we have a series of four other inductors, DQ'd with some resistor in parallel to them. This is all to control resonances and create a nice flat response. And then finally, a very thin line, which then enters this cavity here on the left, uh, where the RF part is. So you can see how many more components there are 
in the DC path of this bias T in order to get to the kind of frequency response we're looking for and down to 50 kilohertz. And this is, of course, quite a bit more expensive. Now, this one doesn't work. It also has no DC coming out. You can see here's a V, v connector. I don't know if I can focus on this. Or this. It's a V connector on one side. So this one is a little bit more possible to open, but I'm going to leave this for a different video because it's going to require a lot of time to make sure we can fix this. This is very, very valuable. But anyway, let's get back to the Android 2 ones. So I was looking at some of the other BiSDs, and this one is actually labeled Wiltron. Wiltron was purchased by Android 2 quite a while ago, and then I looked at one of them, and check this out. Now this one has a bent pin. So I wonder if this was considered also damaged in the same way, but it's actually just a bent pin problem. Well, there's only one way to find out. We're going to straighten this pin out and try to measure it. All right, I straightened it out. I think it looks pretty good. It's actually, you can't even tell that it was bent at some point. So now we can measure it. Okay, let's go ahead and measure it. The very first thing is to make sure the bias is not shorted. So we're going to measure the resistance of the bias input port by plugging it in here and we see nothing. So it's still an open circuit, which is a good sign. Then we're going to connect the termination to the output port of the bias D. Now we should be able to measure the termination resistance because we're basically shorting the output with a 50 ohm resistor here. We're going to try that as well. There we go. And what do we read? We read 50 ohms. Perfect. So the DC connection of this particular one seems to be intact. So it might still be okay. The resistance is still normal. If we have two ohms of extra resistance. That's not a problem. The only other thing to measure is the response through the bias to make sure that capacitor is also okay. And here we are measuring the S parameter of it. There it is. I've connected it to port 1 and port 2. And you can see that we are looking at about half a dB of loss at 10 GHz. Now this is going to continue to go down, but this is expected at 1.2 dB of loss anyway. This is probably what it's going to be roughly around 40 GHz or so. So I think this is actually a good bias D. We can put it into our tools for future experiments. But the rest of them are unfortunately, as you saw, completely dead. And there you have it. I hope you enjoyed this, and thanks to the person who sent this in. I'll try to do more of these mailbag videos, hopefully, and let me know if there is something you'd like to send in for me to take a look at. As always, I'll see you in the comment section.